I thought my mom was a Die Hard fan, but then one time I saw this Reddit post about a woman who had an Outlander watch party and everybody had to wear the Clan Fraser tartan and then she made her friend leave because she didn't show up wearing the right thing. Anyway, my mom bought me the shirt. Thanks, mom. Happy belated Mother's Day. So, why do moms like Outlander? Why is it so popular? Is it really just porn for moms? I'm glad you asked. Let's dive in. Content warning. This video contains discussion of sexual assault and other things of that nature. Also, spoilers for the show Outlander. Also, maybe a bit of the books too. What is Outlander? Outlander is a TV show about a nurse named Claire Beecham Randall Beecham Fraser Randall Fraser, who gets transported back in time from post-war Britain to 1743 Scotland. It stars Katrina Balfe and Sam Hewen as our main two characters, Claire and Jamie. The TV series began in 2014 and is based off of the book series by the same name by Diana Gabaldon. The first book was published in 1991 and the ninth book of the series is supposed to be released this November. The books have sold over 20 million copies and have been translated into over 20 languages. The show is on stars and has been nominated for multiple Golden Globes and Emmys. It cleaned up at the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Awards as well. The show has been renewed for a seventh season. It has over 2,000 fix on AO3 and has over 2 million likes on Facebook. There are entire conventions dedicated to just Outlander, and also apparently watch parties where you get kicked out if you're not dressed in cultural appropriation. Anyway, it's huge. The first eight episodes averaged about 5.1 million viewers across multiple platforms, and except for this last season, the fifth season, every episode has been viewed by over a million people. The fifth season's lower ratings could be attributed to the fact that um, Comcast took stars off of its main cable packages and you now have to pay for stars separately. And this was done like literally five days before Outlander season five came out, which is kind of scummy. Like what is this, Nickelodeon and The Legend of Korra? When you look at the Nielsen ratings, 64% of the people watching Outlander are women. And when half of those women are ages 25 to 54, that's statistically a lot of moms. So what about the other 34% of people watching? Well, it's difficult to get statistics, but how many men had to watch this because their wives or girlfriends made them do so? The world may never know. But every time I mention Outlander to a group of people, both men and women and everybody else seem to really enjoy the show. And yet you don't really hear people talk about this the way that you did Game of Thrones or The Office, but clearly there's a lot of people watching. It seems like everyone and their mother has seen like at least one episode of the show. I myself have seen almost every episode of all five seasons and I didn't even want to watch it. My mom only agreed to watch Avatar The Last Airbender with me if I watched Outlander with her, so. It seems like for a lot of women, this is a guilty pleasure show. I don't believe in the concept of guilty pleasures, like either enjoy something or don't. My coworkers know that I am reading Miraculous Ladybug fan fiction in the break room. Like you gotta own it. Blog after blog of women watching or reading Outlander mention doing so while the husband is at home or while the kids are asleep or etc. While society has long mocked things that women openly enjoy, and that's like a topic for a whole different video, it seems that Outlander has been spared from a Twilight-esque crucifixion. Maybe because it's actually good. It's well made, it has something for everyone, and has a unique take on the typical historical romance tropes. What are these typical historical romance tropes? I'm glad you asked. Let's talk about good old-fashioned bodice rippers. Bodice rippers are a subgenre of romance literature that came about in the 70s with the rise of second wave feminism as well as the untabooifying of female sexuality. It's a word. It is now. English is a dumb language. Published in 1972, The Flame and the Flower by Kathleen Woodowis is the book that pioneered a lot of the tropes now associated with this genre. These tropes include a historical setting, the female main character who is a virgin, the main love interest rapes her and she subsequently loses her virginity. Eventually their sex becomes consensual. The female is a captive of the male love interest. And also there is a secondary love interest that is infinitely worse and more brutish than whatever the primary love interest is. Also, the couple gets married at the end, yay. So even though the notion of premarital sex at this time was becoming more and more acceptable, it was not a universal by any means. To work around this, the female lead being raped was a plot device that allowed her to have a sexual experience without having to take responsibility for the premarital sex. 
These scenes also are typically written to be less violent than you might assume and are to fulfill a rape fantasy that many women have. A study of 355 undergraduate women from researchers at Notre Dame University found that 52% of women admitted to having fantasized about being forced by a man to surrender sexually against their will, while 32% of women admitted to fantasizing about being raped by a man. So that's what bodice ripper rape scenes are about. They're more fantasy than reality. Bodice rippers fell out of popularity by the 1980s, but the tropes associated with them are still around today. The idea of moms reading probably pornography, historical romance books is still an idea that permeates popular culture. Fatima. I need you. Many of Outlander's critics accuse it of being nothing more than a bodice ripper. Is Outlander a bodice ripper? Well, no. But yes, sort of, hear me out. Let's go through these tropes. By the way, I'm talking about the show, not the books. I have not read the books. I can't read. Number one, a historical setting. Outlander isn't only a historical setting, but is doubly so. Claire begins her journey in post-war Britain in the 1940s and then gets transported back further in time into the 1700s. But time travel and historical setting does not a bodice ripper make, so let's keep going. Number two, the heroine is a virgin. So when we first meet Claire, she's already married to a guy named Frank Randall and they have been married for some time, actually where she begins her story there on their second honeymoon. Rather, Jamie is the one who is a virgin. Gasp. When Claire has to marry Marry him for plot reasons, don't worry about it. She even asks, Doesn't it bother you that I'm not a virgin? And he responds, Well, uh, no, as long as it doesn't bother you that I am. In one of the most famous moments of the show, they have to consummate their marriage with Claire showing him how to do so. I had to watch this with my mom. Number three, the main love interest rapes her and it eventually becomes consensual. So there's a lot of rape in this story. Like, unfortunately there really is. It's one of the biggest criticisms of both the books and the show that rape gets used as a plot device so often. This is a list of everybody in Outlander who has either been sexually assaulted, almost sexually assaulted, or otherwise forced into having sex. But it's never Jamie on Claire or Claire on Jamie. They always have consensual sex. There's this scene that gets brought up a lot when discussing why women love men who are violent towards them, and I don't really think that it's fair. In this scene, Jamie, being from the 18th century, decides that he needs to punish his wife for getting captured. While he does get violent, Claire manages to convince him that it's a terrible thing to do and that maybe you shouldn't beat your wife. She makes him swear that he will never lay a hand on her again and, and he swears and it's all done. But he doesn't sexually assault her and he comes around to understanding why it's barbaric and you shouldn't beat your wife. What a novel concept. But again, he does not sexually assault her. Moving on. Number four, heroine is a captive of a love interest. So this is complicated because like everybody in Outlander gets captured by somebody else at some point over the course of the show. Claire is more or less being held captive by Colin McKenzie when she first arrives in the 1700s because she's like suspicious. I mean, she's an English woman in her underwear wandering alone in the Scottish Highlands. Like I, I get it. But it's not Jamie that's holding her captive. She has to marry Jamie for plot reasons. Don't worry about it. But Jamie doesn't make her do it, nor is he the one that suggests doing it. Jamie actually lets her go back through the stones when she tells him the truth about where she's from. So no, she's not his captive. Number five, the secondary love interest is infinitely worse. So this is also complicated. So like I said, Claire begins um, her story married to her husband, Frank. Frank is a decent guy for now, and they really do love each other. Most of the first season is her trying to reconcile her feelings for Jamie with the fact that she's married to a man who won't be born for another 200 years. The problem is that the main antagonist of the first and second season is a guy named Black Jack Randall, who is Frank's ancestor and is the spitting image of Frank. I mean, they're, they're played by the same actor. Black Jack Randall is not a love interest for Claire by any means. I mean, he does terrible things to her and Jamie and other people that a typical love interest of a bodice ripper might do. It's a really interesting twist on the secondary love interest slash love triangle dynamic. Anyway, believing that Jamie dies in the Battle of Culloden, Claire goes back to the 20th century to try to work it out with Frank and also have her baby with the benefit of modern medical technology. So you could say that Frank is a secondary love interest just later on. Frank turns out to be kind of scummy. He keeps information from Claire and he has extramarital affairs. So yeah, I guess he, he is worse. So all that being said, is Outlander a bodice ripper? Well, I'm not the end-all authority on genre defining, but 
I really don't think that it is. I think it plays enough on the tropes that viewers are familiar with that it could gain popularity among fans of bodice rippers, but I don't think that it is one itself. The general appeal of Outlander. So as someone who isn't a diehard Outlander fan, I do think that the show has something for everyone. Like, yeah, there's the romance, but there's also this grand sense of adventure. There's a huge cast of characters, sightseeing, politics, war. I mean, it really is Game of Thrones for soccer moms. Oh, that was first stated here. Let's see what they had to say. Huh, wonder what happened here. Surely the backlash wasn't so severe that the article had to be removed. Surely. The show is also really, really well made. Like a lot of love and a lot of money went into making the show. This WikiLeaks uh, budget estimate from the show's first season puts it around $25 million. I'm not gonna pay for IMDb Pro to find this information, are you kidding me? The script is great, the shots are beautiful, everything is well researched, the actors are all talented and believable mostly. My real father is some six foot three inch red-headed guy in a kilt from the 18th century? Also, avid fans of the books are more likely to enjoy the show because Diana Gabaldon is a writer and a consultant, and it ensures that the show never goes too far off the rails from what the author intended. So that's all well and good, but what do moms like? The mom appeal. There's something about Scottish men, apparently. Poll after poll after poll find the same results. Women love men with Scottish accents. It's worth noting that this is the case before and after Outlander's rise to popularity, but the numbers have only gone up in favor of the Scottish accent in a post-Outlander world. Speaking of Scottish men, let's talk about our leading man, Jamie Fraser. Jamie is, of course, handsome. I mean, he's not my type, but it's like universally agreed upon that he's like the most handsome man in the world, I guess. He's strong and brave and all that, but he does have a good personality on top of it. He's a gentleman, he's very smart, he's charming and witty, he's good with kids, he's fairly emotionally open with his wife. I mean, he's a good dude. When you see post after post after post on r slash relationship advice about men who won't help out around the house or who don't wanna talk about their feelings or refuse to help with their own children or just straight up cheat on their wives, it's very easy to see why this fictional Highland warrior is very popular with women. That's not to say he doesn't have faults. I mean, he's stubborn, he's hot-headed, he's a fugitive. I mean, except for that last part, that's, that's all pretty realistic. And I know that's subjective, but it's more realistic than say, I don't know, a hundred year old vampire who thinks that going back to high school over and over again is a good use of his time and his only personality trait is being overly possessive. So what about our narrator, Claire? Unlike a lot of women in popular romance stories, though not necessarily bodice rippers, she actually has a personality and isn't just a shell for the viewers slash readers to project themselves onto. You certainly don't see a lot of Claire hate the way that you saw a lot of Bella hate back in the prime of Twilight for this very reason. I love you, Kristen Stewart. I'm sorry that people are mean to you. You deserve better. Claire is smart and witty. She's a nurse and later a doctor. She's very skilled in her field and she earns people's respect with this skill, even in the 1700s when it was very difficult for women to rise above the level of just being a homemaker. She is tough as nails too. I mean, Claire has gone through a lot during this show, especially this last season. She's been thrown back in time, assaulted by multiple men, kidnapped, tortured, suffered a brutal miscarriage, not to mention the emotional baggage of going back in time and then thinking that your husband's dead, so then you go back, but then your actual husband is, is dead, but then you have to go back. But anyway, Claire's been through a lot. She's also really pretty. It's only fitting that the most handsome man in Scotland has someone to marry who is equally as attractive. If we learned anything from the Bella hate, it's that fans would not have tolerated someone they perceived as any less attractive to be paired with the love interest. The show also isn't afraid to show Claire as she ages. Like, yeah, she tries to make herself look younger when she goes back to see Jamie after 20 years, but that doesn't last long, obviously. She has gray hair, she has wrinkles in her face, you know, like a normal woman would in her 50s. I should also point out that Jamie is younger than Claire, which is really interesting considering, you know, Hollywood's couples both on and off screen having such large age gaps with usually the man being the one that is significantly older. It's worth noting that because most of the story is told through Claire's perspective, we get a uniquely female experience both in the books and the show. I think this is most evident in the sex scenes. The sex scenes with Jamie and Claire at least are about two consenting adults sharing intimacy rather than outrageous sexual fantasies. The camera usually focuses on Jamie's body rather than Claire's, so we get very few gratuitous cleavage shots, you might say. It's very different than sex scenes in most movies, which are framed to emphasize the female figure. The very first sexual encounter in the show, in the first episode between Claire and Frank, is Frank 
performing oral sex on her and then receiving nothing in return. I had to watch this with my mom. This show is for women, plain and simple. And when a show is made from a female perspective, it's going to resonate with a lot of women who are desperate for media that doesn't sexualize them. If you're going to accuse this of being mom porn like Fifty Shades was, get a, get a better critique. Whether or not Outlander is mom porn is really up to you. I think that it's more than that, but to compare it to Fifty Shades really isn't fair. Fifty Shades is honestly more of a bodice ripper than Outlander is. I will direct your attention to Folding Ideas three-part series on the Fifty Shades movie franchise, which is here. He says everything that I would like to talk about. The idea also of mom porn comes from, you know, a history of mocking women for having any sexual thoughts at all. Also, you probably shouldn't Google mom porn if you're looking for more content on this topic. I mean, men, and this obviously includes dads, watch things with sex scenes all the time that are usually focused on the female body or putting men in the position of power. And we don't call that dad porn. Also, you probably shouldn't look that up either. In conclusion, Outlander's well-produced historical realism, large cast of characters and interesting plot, as well as uniquely female perspective, make this show very popular with women. And when a lot of women are also moms, it becomes a show for moms. If you're looking for something adventurous or thrilling to watch, I mean, Outlander is pretty good. I do believe that anybody can get interested in the plot and characters, even men and dads, if they can look past the possibly gratuitous sex scenes like the rest of us do when we're watching literally anything else. A very special thank you to Josh Ferguson, my very first patron. If you'd like to uh, check me out on Patreon, my link is in the description. Yay.